weird. The uh, viewfinder is making this look like it's straight ahead blue, but it is actually a purple color. I don't know if you guys will see it or if I'll see it in the finished video, but yes, it's a new sweatshirt color. I have an array of new colors uh, for six new albums that I'll be talking about today. And also it's a metaphor for something new that might be coming up very, very soon. Keep your eyes and ears peeled. Have I intrigued you yet? one and all and welcome back to Tom's Head Parade. It's been a very strange year for new album releases. I don't know if it's been that way for you but it's been that way for me. Uh, I've mentioned this before but I've been having a lot of trouble over the course of this year since the spring anyway really concentrating on listening to new album releases absorbing them figuring out what I think about them what I feel about them with 2020 being what it is and uh, that's why my now and then videos and my spank and platters videos have been very sporadic over the course of this year uh, it's taken me an awful long time to uh as i said to, to really digest albums and i think it's because since the future the immediate future even is just so precarious and uncertain i find a lot of comfort in listening to old favorites older albums it's just you know you kind of you, you feel uh, nostalgic for that time back when everything was more certain you know obviously the past is much more comfortable to us it's, it's a psychological thing i'm sure any of you out there who are psychologists or psychology majors or whatever would probably uh that would probably track the the logic behind that would track but anyway that's a whole different subject uh, I, I could do a whole other video just on that topic if i wanted to but then this is a music channel and not a psychology channel so i probably won't uh but yes i know this uh on my channel i have not put nearly the emphasis on new and recent album reviews and stuff like that that so many other youtubers do out there the spectrum pulses and artvs and needle drops of the youtube community that's their bread and butter that's what they do that's what you go to their channels for i like to have much more of a variety on my channel so uh I don't do a lot of new album reviews, but I still like to do some. I like to keep up on the new stuff and uh, give you a, at least a vague idea of what I think of recent releases. So that's a, that is what Spankin' Platters is for. And yes, this is my new Spankin' Platters video, the third one this year. Uh, probably a month or two late. I have no idea how late it is. Uh, I try to do it quarterly, but you know, as I said, 2020 being what it's been. Uh, but anyway, yes, I have six albums uh, today that I'd like to talk about. Uh, recent releases from the past probably four or five months, I think, at, at this point it's been. So uh, that, that's how far behind I am on Spankin' Platters. Uh, so yes, let's just go ahead and get started. First up on the docket for today is Chromatica, the fifth solo studio album by Lady Gaga. Yes, I've been a fan of Gaga basically since she released the single Born This Way off of the album of the same name, her sophomore album. And yes, it was just a fantastic anthem, a just a great great song one of my favorite songs from that year in fact and uh, one of the things i've been enjoying most about lady gaga is seeing all the different facets of music that she's been capable of all of her different sides of being a performer and an entertainer over the years it's just been fascinating to watch and in fact particularly over these last six years she's made several detours uh, she did a standards album with Tony Bennett called Cheek to Cheek. It was fantastic. I loved it. Uh, her country folkish album, Joanne, which was amazing. It was wonderful. Very nice and understated. And then she did a soundtrack for A Star is Born. So, yeah, she's done lots of different things over the past six years. But uh, now with this album, Chromatica, she is back to the electro dance pop that she first made a name for herself for, that she first became famous for. And uh, she is back with a vengeance in that genre in my opinion uh, i am really really enjoying this album although it did take me a while and that's the case with a few of the albums that i'll be talking about today it took me a while to really get into it for the album to really grow on me but uh once once it did once it clicked it, it just clicked in a big way uh, honestly i love this album and this album is pretty much in a tie with dua lipa's future nostalgia for female pop album of the year in my opinion it's got great hooks, it's got personal and well-crafted lyrics. I mean, what more can you ask for? My two favorite singles off this album were Rain On Me and 911. Fantastic, excellent singles. I love those. And uh, there were four album tracks that I really enjoyed. Babylon, Free Woman, Replay, and Enigma. I really, really enjoyed those. Uh, those They might be uh, odd choices. Some people might not like those songs, but I really enjoyed them. I consider those some of the bright spots on this album. And I really liked Sign From Above but somehow i feel like it should have been more than it was uh, particularly since elton john was guesting on it i mean you know you would think elton john it's going to be a great great song but it left something to be des desired for me and i'm not sure what 
honestly. So uh, take that with what you will. And uh, I liked Stupid Love also, except that it reminds me a little too much of Born This Way, the song. So yeah, that's the only the only drawback of that song that I found. But uh, yeah, all in all, this is an excellent album. There were no songs on it that I truly thought were bad. Or, I mean, the interludes were, well, the interludes are what they are. They're just kind of there. They, I think, did a decent job of separating the album into three sections. But other than that, yeah, I was not truly disappointed in anything about this album. I just thought it was great. And I think this one may be in my top ten of the year. We'll have to see. Uh, as I said, it, it's going to be fi fighting with uh, Dua Lipa's future nostalgia uh, for the top female album, uh, pop album of the year. But, yeah, excellent album. Coming up next, we have one of the more recent albums, I believe, in the list of albums I'll be talking about today. It is The Killers, with their sixth album, Imploding the Mirage. Now, I really, really enjoyed The Killers' debut album, Hot Fuss, but for some reason after that, I just kind of fell off on listening to them. I It was the better part of ten years I didn't listen to them at all for some reason. I just moved on to other stuff, I guess. But in the last two years, it's only been within the last couple of years, I started listening to their previous albums, started picking them up. I actually have them all now. And uh, so, yes, I was eagerly, eagerly awaiting this album by the time it was announced. I uh, went through a couple of uh, delays due to COVID, but it was amazing once I finally was able to pick it up and listen to the singles, and it was just, it's fantastic. It's, in my opinion, it is their best album in a while, and that's coming from someone who liked Wonderful Wonderful more than most other people seem to. I actually rather like that album, uh, but not as much as this one, though. This is a, an excellent album, probably their best album in three or four albums, I think. Uh, My Own Soul's Warning is a great anthemic opener, just fantastic. And the closing title track was also really good, although it was a little bit different uh, from the rest of the songs on the album. Caution is fantastic. I love that song. Fire and Bone and When the Dreams Run Dry. Both of those songs I really enjoyed because they reminded me of Tears for Fears, or to a lesser degree, Years and Years. No rhyme intended. Uh, so yeah, just very good song. A little bit 80s throwback with that uh, kind of an exotic percussion that they used in those two songs. That's, why, that's one reason I really like those. They really caught my ear. Uh, both of the features, Lightning Fields with Katie Lang and My God with Wise Blood, they were great, I thought. I, I never thought that Katie Lang would sound good on a killer's track, but there you go. I mean, that's that's the wonder that uh, the, I guess the producers involved with this album did. Uh, just fantastic. Uh, and of course, but then again, Katie Lang's voice is just beautiful. I mean, how can you not like her voice? You you might not like her her traditional stuff, the stuff that she usually puts out, but she's got a beautiful voice, honestly. Uh, although I do like her stuff. Uh, there are a couple of songs, Dying Breed and Running Towards a Place. They seemed a little bland, but maybe only because the rest of the album was just so good. So, uh, yeah, kind of like Chromatica, uh, nothing really, really truly bad on this album at all. Just a couple songs that were a little bit underwhelming. But yeah, it's an excellent album, and I think, I'm think i pretty sure this is going to end up in my top ten as well. Just uh, some just great anthemic sing-along choruses uh, to some of these songs. You just you know play them with the windows rolled down or with the top down on your car going down the highway in the afternoon. Just great stuff for that. Uh, it's an excellent album. Great, great outing. The sixth album, Outing by the Killers, Imploding the Mirage. Okay, the third album in today's video just happens to be the third album by this artist, and this artist happens to be a trio. I swear it, I didn't plan this, it just happens to be the way it worked out. I actually didn't realize that I was, it was this way until just a couple minutes ago. Uh, just the way that the number three lined up cosmically this way. Anyway, it is Haim with their third album, Women in Music Part 3. They're, they're rather tongue-in-cheekly titled third album by this artist. Uh, and this is perhaps my favorite album of theirs yet. I, I got into Haim with, from day one with their first album. I really enjoyed that one. I like their second one, uh, not quite as much as their first, but honestly, as I said, this just might be their best album yet. Uh, it was co-produced by Rostam of Vampire Weekend, and as such, it has some of that sparse, lightly world music-influenced sound that Vampire Weekend is famous for, and uh, that's only a good thing in my opinion. It's a good uh, complement to their sound, honestly. And yeah, with, with their three voices in there, it's just for some reason, it just seems like a natural fit. Uh, the Steps was the first single that I heard, and Don't Wanna was the second, and I love them both, and I still do. They're just fantastic. Uh, Leaning On You is just absolutely beautiful with its echoey guitars and the wonderful vocal harmonies on that song. I absolutely love that funky and slightly receded into the background saxophone on the track Summer Girl. Uh, that just totally makes that song, in my opinion. 
and the song Hallelujah is just plain beautiful, gorgeous, and it's an original, by the way. It's not a cover of the Leonard Cohen song. So yeah, that, that's just that's another standout. Uh, I like the song I've Been Down as much as I do, probably because it reminds me a lot of Edie Brickell. It's just it's got that Edie Brickell sound that I've really really loved uh, the past few years. I've really gotten into Edie Brickell, and I shouldn't like the song All That Ever Mattered as much as I do, but but I do. It, it's 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 weird in a good way, and but there's a song that is weird but not in a good way, and that is I Know Alone. And it's just it's just very strange. It's very odd, and I just don't really care much for that one. Uh, and then we have 3 a.m., which was a very R&B sounding song, which just it just seemed out of place on the album, honestly. Uh, but really, those are the only two missteps on this album that I could really find. It drags it a little bit down from the other two albums in that they're not really meh or innocuous tracks. They're actually a little bit on the what side. You know, it's like, what were they trying to do here? That was the effect that I got from those two songs. But yeah. All in all, though, uh, this is a very good album. I, I really enjoyed it. I do not regret picking it up at all. And uh, yes, uh, probably the second best Haim album in their discography. I really enjoyed it. Okay, coming up next, we have what has probably been my most highly anticipated album of the year so far. It is Gaslighter, the fifth major label album and eighth album overall by The Chicks, formerly known as The Dixie Chicks. Uh, yes, uh, I started getting into the Chicks right about the time that they put out their song Not Ready to Make Nice, which was a, a bit, bit of a political statement, a rebuttal of sorts uh, against uh, President George W. Bush. Some of you may or may not recall that. Uh, and that was off of their album Taking the Long Way, which was I, I picked up and really, really enjoyed. And little did I know that would be their last album for, was it been 14 years? So yeah, I, I had to wait a long time for this album. And uh, as soon as I saw the video for the lead-off single of the title track, uh, I was anxiously awaiting this album, uh, especially when I heard that the album was being co-produced by Jack Antonoff. That was you know, another huge reason I was anticipating this album. Uh, I've, I've enjoyed everything that Jack Antonoff has done, practically. And uh, the next single, March March, excited me even more. So yes, uh, my sister was a big fan of the Chicks and had three of their albums in her collection, which I inherited. And so, yeah, I, I, after I heard Taking the Long Way, I didn't bother going any further in there. And But inheriting my sister's CD collection gave me the, the opportunity. And uh, ever since then, I've been really appreciated the chicks and what they've done and, and their, their talents. Unfortunately, in spite of the fact that this was my most highly anticipated album of the year, it was one of the most disappointing in a way. Um, yeah, the rest of the album doesn't quite live up to the singles, unfortunately. Uh, not that it's necessarily a bad album. It was just a little bit underwhelming after the, the biting socio-political statements of those first two singles. Although, to be honest, uh, some of us listeners might have read a little bit more into that than was there. So yeah, that in a way is our own fault, I guess you'd say. Uh, but that's not to say this album does not have highlights beyond those two singles. Uh, For Her is a beautiful ballad. I really, really enjoyed that one. And uh, Hope It's Something Good it was just a, a heartbreaking uh, breakup song. It was just so sad. And Juliana Calm Down was another standout. Uh, Texas Man was kind of fun. I really enjoyed that one. I got a kick out of the lyrics, uh, perhaps partly because I was born in Texas, so I kind of have a personal connection to it. So, but yeah, that one was... Uh, particularly entertaining might be an odd choice uh, to for some of you out there but uh, yeah but honestly beyond that there wasn't much else that really grabbed me about this album uh, and again not that the album was bad it's just yeah it, it kind of was underwhelming maybe just because those first two singles as I said just uh, drummed up so much promise with the album that uh, yeah the strongest tracks on the album unfortunately were the singles so but I, I still like the album I'm still not sorry that I picked it up and uh, yeah don't know if it's going to be. It's probably not going to be in my top 10, but uh, that remains to be seen. We've still got a couple of months to go. Okay, the next to last album I'll be talking about in today's video is Unfollow the Rules by Rufus Wainwright. Now, this is his eighth conventional album, and I'll get to what I mean by conventional in just a minute here. Uh, he's not exactly a conventional artist. His last two releases were an opera called Prima Donna and a partially spoken word album based on Shakespeare's sonnets called Take All My Loves. So yes, I'm not counting those two albums in calling this his eighth album. This is his eighth conventional pop album, pop-oriented album. His last such album was 2012's Out of the Game, which was produced by Mark Ronson. Uh, this album was co-produced by Mitchell Froome and David Boucher. So yes, uh, I've been a fan of Rufus basically since the beginning uh, for, with his self-titled album. It was fantastic. And he's always, always kind of followed a, what I guess is called a Baroque pop or chamber pop 
um, uh, sound, pretty much. Uh, my appreciation for him, though, has faded a bit in recent years, partially because of those odd detours that I just talked about. Uh, but I still wanted to pick this album up. I, I heard uh, one of the singles, or was it two of the singles, beforehand, and rather enjoyed them. And although this album, like most of the others in this list, took me a while to get into, and in fact I'm still absorbing it, uh, honestly, it's been worth it, and I, I've actually rather really enjoyed this album. Uh, one of the first songs that really caught my ear on this album is a song called You Ain't Big. And it's also one of the uh, hookier songs, which explains why it caught my ear first. And also perhaps the funniest and most lighthearted of any of the other songs on this album. And the lyrics go into talking about you ain't big unless you've made it in. And rather than saying songs, mentioning cities like New York or LA or Chicago, he talks about uh, the smaller cities in like Kansas and elsewhere in the Midwest. Like you ain't big unless you made it in Topeka. So, you know, so, uh, shows his absurdist or uh, sardonic sense of humor that he sometimes has in his catalog. And he, he occasionally does the self-deprecating kind of sense of humor, but not that much. But uh, yeah, all throughout his catalog, you'll notice little bits and uh, pieces of, of his, his humorous side in his songs. Uh, two of the songs that I uh, enjoyed that were kind of fun also on this album were Trouble in Paradise and Damsel in Distress. Uh, those were actually the, the first two songs on the album. But there are two songs on here that I enjoyed a bit more than those, which were Peaceful Afternoon, which kind of had a waltzy sound to it, just like a gentle swing waltz kind of a sound, and also the gently bouncy uh, song called Romantical Man. That was another, another highlight on here. And there's another song on here that was kind of uh, dirgy and bluesy, sort of, a little bit more understated, and that one's called Early Morning Madness, and I really enjoyed that one as well. So... Uh, but the rest of the album, I am still trying to digest. This is one of those, and, and that's one of the things about Rufus Wainwright is it takes a while to really digest and absorb his albums for the most part. They're, they're not albums that you're going to glom onto right away. And that's kind of one of the things that I like about Rufus. You know, you know, catchy albums that just grab you by the ears right, up, right off the bat are fine. But there's something to be said for the albums that kind of take a while to really, to really sink in in the coming couple of months uh, by the time I do my year-end countdown. Hopefully I will uh, think more of this album than I do now. Not that I don't like it, as I said, I, I enjoy it, but uh, hopefully soon I will enjoy it more. Okay, the last album on today's docket is also the most recent release. It was just put out a couple weeks ago, two or three weeks ago. It is The Speed of Now Part 1, the 11th album by Keith Urban. Now, I have checked out Keith Urban's stuff before, but it has been several years since I've tried, and in the meantime, I've become fond of Brad Paisley and Kenny Chesney, both of whom I've really come to enjoy because they tend to push the boundaries of the genre. And uh, yeah, there were two features on this album that teased me into taking a chance and picking it up, and they kind of uh, uh, push the genre, as I, as I said. Uh, Out the Cage, which is the opening track, that features Breland and Nile Rodgers. And that is basically... Three parts bluegrass and one part R&B. It might sound kind of weird, but it works, and, and I, I rather enjoy that song. And the song right after it, uh, One Too Many, features Pink. And that plays on her strengths and is also a, a bit of an R&B power ballad sort of thing. And Pink actually guest starred on one of Kenny Chesney's recent albums. And so that was kind of a, a connection in a way that uh, compelled me to check out this album. And there were a couple of other genre-bending tracks on here that I kind of liked, and but genre bending to a lesser degree than those first two that I mentioned. Say Something was pretty good despite its uh, repetitive chorus. The chorus was a little bit repetitive. Uh, and there's another song on here called Soul Food, which I rather enjoy. That was really catchy. And uh, Better Than I Am is probably the most gorgeous ballad on the album. It's just absolutely beautiful. It gives me chills practically listening to it. It's just fantastic. Uh, and a couple of other real good standouts on here are Live With and Polaroid and With You. Those, those are just a couple of other great tracks that are that are still growing on me. And I am still absorbing this album since it just came out a few weeks ago, but I honestly, I rather enjoy it. And if this is my first taste of Keith Urban, I think I'm going to enjoy exploring his back catalog quite a bit more. So, uh, yeah, very nice. And I, I have a feeling, as I said, I have a feeling this is going to grow on me quite a bit more in uh, the coming weeks. Well, there you have it for the fall edition of Spankin' Platters, or was this a summer edition? I can't remember. That's the kind of year 2020 has been, right? And yes, uh, sorry I had 
Not as much to say about some albums as I had to say about others, but uh, well, that's kind of the way it is, and that's one reason why I like this Spankin' Platters format, because I don't have to spend a whole lot of time on any album, and it still makes for a reasonably good video, a reasonably worth watching video, I guess. But anyway, that'll do it for Spankin' Platters for summer or fall or whatever it was. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, hit that like button and share it with your friends. And give me your thoughts, questions, suggestions, or constructive criticisms in the comment section below. Also, scroll down to the description for the link to my Twitter and Instagram feeds, and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and browse my past videos, and be sure to ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.